<clears throat> Fellow brothers and sisters, I do greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I also do welcome you to the service as you continue to support us and listen to the word of God. And I urge you to continue to pray for us um, for such a time as this. Let us pray. God our Father, we quieten ourselves to be to your presence, to ourselves, to you and to each other. We come as we are, sometimes lost because we choose our own way and not yours. Because we make an outward show of your way, but without love, and that is not your way. Thank you for your outrageous love, always and forever welcoming us home. We pray this in your name, Father. Amen. I would call my brother Ben to come and read the word of God. That is coming from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Good morning and God bless. I hope you're all well this week and uh, really excited to be here to be able to read the word of God to you. And I uh, just want to let you know you're all amazing. It says it in the Bible that God created you. and Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you're an amazing person. Uh, and I just encourage you to realise this and realise that other people are amazing too. And uh, yeah, just pray for them and love, love your neighbour and everything. It's pretty awesome. God is awesome. So as Johnson mentioned, uh, we'll be reading from Luke 15, 1 to 10. And it says, Jesus tells the parables of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep he, until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the, in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she light a lamp? Uh, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it and when she finds it she calls her friends and neighbours together and says rejoice with me I have found my lost coin in the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents praise God and uh, it's going to be a great message today so we'll get Johnson back to hear what the Lord's put on his heart for us for this week and yeah be good amen uh, this morning I've decided to share with you on a theme what do a sheep and a coin have in common what do a sheep and a coin have in common a, a, a woman approached a pastor with a question where is the lost and found department in our church? I've lost my glasses and I can't just see well. The pastor replied, we don't actually have a lost and found department. You might check the secretary's desk. Maybe you'll find your glasses there. After the woman left, the pastor rethought his answer. And actually the whole church is a lost and found department. The business of the church is to find the lost. So the incident that gave rise to Jesus' parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin in Luke 15 verses 1 to 10 was the attitude of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They grumbled when they saw tax collectors and sinners being welcomed by Jesus. Jesus didn't approve 
of the behavior of the tax collectors and sinners, but he demonstrated God's welcome to all people who repent. So the religious leaders regarded tax collectors as the least worth members of society. After all, in Jesus' time, tax collectors were Jews who were traitors. So they collected money from fellow Jews to give to the Romans. In the process, they lined their own pockets by taking extra for themselves. So tax collectors were the scum of society, the least important people around. So the religious leaders saw common people as sinners. The religious leaders considered themselves better than the common people spiritually, morally, and economically. Sinners were regarded as hopeless, lost souls. Like the woman with lost glasses, these religious leaders didn't see very well. They were short-sighted. Jesus told the parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin to correct their lack of vision. So the word loss is generally used in two ways. The word may describe someone who sins and is separated from God and people by that sin. The word may also be used to describe someone who is confused by his or her surroundings, geographical, mental, or spiritual, who can find his or her own way. The Bible uses the term loss both ways. So Jesus welcomed tax collectors and other bad people who had broken the commandments of God and the laws of the land. So he didn't welcome them because he approved of their behavior. He welcomed them because he saw that the religious leaders of his day didn't see their need. And that's why he had welcomed them. Looking down on notorious traitors, cheats and other evildoers is understandable but dangerous. It is understandable of, uh, because we don't want to promote or approve evil people doing evil deeds and not facing justice for their deeds. But it is dangerous because before God, a self-righteous judgmental attitude is as bad as the deeds of people evil. When we take it upon ourselves to think that we are righteous, that is also dangerous. Which means we are already judging other people so the human malady being addressed here is self-righteousness, expressing itself through grumbling and murmuring. Looking down on people can say more about ourselves than about them. I've re recently discovered a new sin. I found myself looking down on people who look down on people. You, you know, you, 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 you look down on other people who are looking down on other people, which means you're already also sinning. But sometimes because we are self-righteous, we don't take it that way. We think it is our right to look down on people. Whereby it's not our right. Because we are all sinners, only saved by the grace of God. So the second use of the term loss is to do with drifting off in the wrong direction because of being inexperienced or naive like a child who doesn't know better. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 2 to 3, and 10 to 14, the parallel passage to Luke 15, verse 1 to 7, the context of the parable of the lost sheep is welcoming a child. He, Jesus, called a child whom he put among them, the disciples who asked it about who was the greatest in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless you become like a ch children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Okay, it is dangerous for a child to wander off because children can't protect itself from dangers. On Monday, I was in, uh, in, in a place in Mariba, where I had uh, the football club for my son who was attending there for his sports team. And I saw a little boy wandering around, running away from a mom. And at the end, that little boy, I think he could be two, three years. And what did he do? He went on to the mowing, mowing machine. Right on top of it. So you can see that little children, they do wonder. A child can't adequately defend itself against dangers. 
in like manner is dangerous for a sheep to wander off because it is vulnerable to being attacked by wolves or being turned over on its back. A sheep turned over on its back is totally helpless, unable to right itself without help. So a little sheep can lose its footing and fall off a mountain to a shelf below and they die from exposure to the elements of nature. That's why the good shepherd would leave 99 sheep only to look after the one lost sheep. A sheep can be lost as it drifts away from the shepherd and the flock. So can human beings as well. We can drift away from God and others. In the Old Testament lesson for today, Joshua 5, verse 1 to 12, and also I'll read a, 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 compar a comparative uh, a text also from Exodus 32, verse 7 to 14. We hear about the lost Hebrews in the wilderness. They wandered off from God from their moral traditions. Wandering, moving away from God. They wandered off from God they were lost in the wilderness. During the wilderness wandering, if you hear that it took them 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years in the wilderness. They neglected one very important aspect of the Mosaic law. This was circumcision. They initiated, initiated to write into the covenant privilege of God's family, which marked the Jewish nation. So for 40 years, they had no circumcision. A new generation had arisen during the 40 years of wandering, and they now had to undergo this ceremony as a sign of the restoration to the full enjoyment of the covenant blessings. As long as they wandered in the desert, they were ridiculed by the Egyptians for not gaining the promised land. But now, what if they were in land, the reproach was rolled away. Moses was sent by God to go down to Egypt and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Let my people go. So the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. They yearned for freedom and returned to the land of their forefathers. Moses was called by God to lead the people through the wilderness back to the promised land. As slaves, the Hebrews were hopeless and lost. Freed from slavery, they were lost in different ways. So because of their disobedient rebellion, the Hebrews were lost in the wilderness as they traveled through to the promised land. They complained, they murmured against Moses and God. God through Moses sought to save the lost Hebrews. They were lost both in spiritual sense and the sense of wandering in the wilderness. So like the ancient Hebrews, we are lost spiritual on the journey in the wilderness. Like them, we are lured away from God by attractive distractions and false gods. You know, if you look at what is happening today, you can see that people are looking for something. They are seeking for something to fill the gap in their lives. People are out there everywhere. Be it yoga, be it other things they are doing. Which means they are looking for something. Like them, we easily get diverted by wrong things on our journey toward the promised land. Like them, we need to hear and heed the word of God to get back on the path and that leads to eternal life. We need to be found and we need to be saved. It is encouraging to hear that God seeks the lost. It is encouraging to hear that God seeks the least. One sheep seems considerably less important than 99 that do not wander off, but God thinks otherwise. God is a seeker. He searches until he finds the lost and the least. That is the point of the parable of the lost sheep. There is also the point of the parable of the lost coin. To a rich and powerful person, one silver coin, a drachma may have seemed like very little, but to a common laborer, a drachma was one day's full labor, and therefore very important. So to the religious leaders who were in the upper class, a drachma might have seemed like it had little worth, but to a common housewife, a lost drachma was worth a tedious search. That's why the woman had to search for this piece of coin. 
Jesus said, God is more like the common laborer and common housewife than like the rich and powerful upper class. In the parable of the lost coin, Jesus was saying that each individual created in God's image is worth of God's attention. God focuses on each of his children because he loves every one of us and if there's only one of us, he, that's the person he loves. And you know what? The, the, the important thing again is that this drachma or this coin was not lost somewhere far away. It was lost within the building. That's why she had to move out a lot of things. Which means there are some Christians who are lost while they are in the church. Not outside. You don't find them outside. They are lost while they are in the church. Pride, jealous, gossip. All these things are found among those who are in the house. And they are lost because they need to find the Savior. One tradition says the Palestinian woman received 10 silver coins, drachmas, when they got married. Beside their monetary value to a poor family, those coins yield sentimental value like that of a wedding ring. In the same way, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. God grieves over every lost soul and celebrates when a lost soul returns to him. It always grieves me when we, I lose one member, one member of the church. If that member goes to another church, I praise God. But if that member gets lost and never wants to hear about God, it grieves me. It makes my heart bleed. Because that one person is very important. I will try by all means to, to reach out to this person. I will try by all means to talk to this person because this person is very important. As God rejoices over each sinner who returns to him, so we should seek out and witness the Lord's rejoicing in their return. When this person comes back, we rejoice. As God cares for the least, we too should care for the needy, the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the prisoners, those who with other overwhelming needs. And Jesus said, Anything you did for the least of my people, you did it for me. Isn't that great? Anything you did for the least of my people, you did it for me. As Max Lucado puts it, the sign of the saved is the love of the least. How much do we love the least people in our community? Those people of no status, of no value, when you look at them. Those people we consider to be useless. Nothing. Christianity offers a revolutionary vessel of values. St. Paul the Apostle, the premier missionary and theologian of all time, understood the transvaluation of values in the light of his own sin. Paul said, the saying is sure and worth of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He's looking at himself as a sinner. He's saying Christ died for me. And the reason why Christ came is that I am the foremost sinner. But for that very reason, I received the message so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the uttermost patience, making me an example to those who would to believe in him for eternal life. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 and 16. In other words, Paul himself so as one of the lost and the least because of his sin. Because of what he was doing, he finds himself to be one of the lost and the least. In that respect, we are like him. If we don't see our sin as more offensive than the sins of others, we haven't understood our sin at all. The primary comparison is not between you as a sinner and me as a sinner, but between me as a sinner and God as a righteous one. So we don't need to compare ourselves. We need to compare ourselves with God. Not comparing ourselves with each other. We, we are called to compare ourselves to God. This, that eliminates the self-righteousness and arrogance. Because the moment we compare ourselves with others, we think we are better than others. Whereby we are not. A pastor explained Jesus' love for the least and lost sinners to a successful and arrogant businessman. 
So the man replied, if that's what Christianity is all about, I want no part of it. I am a self-made man. When I do something for someone, I expect them to be paid back in kind. These people you talk about, the loss and the least, are just lazy. They can't pay back their debts. They aren't worth of our attention. Since God gives them attention, we have no choice but to do the same. We have no choice but to do the same, said the, replied the pastor. Since God made it his business to find the loss in the list, that's what the church must do too. The church is one big loss and found department. It is one big place where the lost and found us found. So whenever someone comes in the church and they are giving their testimonies of how sinful they are, we should never judge them. Because that is the business of the church. We should rejoice on what they are saying. The self-righteous businessman was like the Pharisees and the scribes in our story. He was spiritually short-sighted. He didn't see that what we should look at as the need of God in everyone's life. The lost and the least have the same need for God that all of us have. The master loves them equal. What do a sheep and a coin have in common? The master values them equally. The master values them. They are very important. So which means I'm very important in the sight of God. No matter what the people say about me, I know that I'm very important before God. You may say anything about me, but what I know is that God loves me. So the distress, the displays, the despise of this world may be better in touch with their need for God than the successful one. The down and out may be the one open to the call to repentance than the up and out. Because when I realize that I'm a sinner, I'm always, I always humble myself so that God, God can lift me up. In addition, whatever we do or don't do, for the loss and the least, we are doing or not doing it for God. That's one thing. Christianity is all about finding and welcoming the lost and the least. Is that our business? Welcoming the lost and the least. So please, don't look down upon anyone. Don't look down upon anyone because our job is to seek the lost and the least. Those whom the society is discarded. Those whom the society, when they look at them, they say they are nobody. And it is only God who can make them a somebody. So may God help us as fellow Christians, even as fellow human beings, not to look down upon anyone else. We should always emulate other people and see the value in them because they've been created in the image of God. And it is that image of God that we value so much. May God bless you all from now and evermore. Amen. Let us uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything. We thank you that you are God. You are God of abundance. You are like a mother who never forgets. We give you thanks for those who have mothered us during difficult times of our life and who have rejoiced us in moments of celebration. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you, Lord, that we are here because of you. You continue to look after us. You continue to seek us. You are God of abundant love. You are like a mother hen who gathers and protects her children under her wing. Teach us what it means to find security in the shadow of your wings. Show us how to reach out and call others in your love and protection. For the weak and vulnerable in our communities, we ask your blessings and your protection. God of abundant love, continue to show us mercy. Continue to forgive us as you continue to look for us, to search for the lost and the least. And among these ones, I may also be found. Help me, Lord. Help every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Brothers and uh, sisters, it is always good to take time to appreciate and thank God after we have heard the word of God. And for this ministry to survive and to go on, it is because of you. Whenever you give generously, things happen and the heavens rejoice. So I ask you, it's time for you to take your offering and just follow the instructions that are given at the end of this service so that you can put your offerings. Let us pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings before you. It is our attitude that compels us to you when we realize that we are nothing without you and that everything that we have comes from you. So, Father, bless us as we give these things that we have for the expansion of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. May you continue to bless us, Father, as we continue to support your ministry. This ministry will not be where it is without you prompting us, calling us to give generously. Bless our offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive grace. God of outrageous love, thanks that we cannot fall out of your love, no matter what our mistake, no matter how mean and grudging our love is, as you welcome us ever with open hearts, with open arms, and large our hearts and our minds to save faithfully and to love outrageously. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Brother Russell.